Yeah, we, we can hear you. So what do we do in the future? Welcome. Or is that just, I'm just reading that channel. Welcome to our here. Uh, and that's how the uh, video I people are going to present to the room. Oh. And I also have the privilege of serving Whatever the chair of the board for Okay. Um, okay. Today, I'm it's great to see some familiar faces. Uh, this is just a real energetic game to make it for us all. If you're not involved in Tech Titans on a regular basis, get involved in Tech Titans on a regular basis. It's just to be encouraged and supported. Uh, that's what this group is all about. Uh, on behalf of the University of Texas at Dallas, the Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science, and especially you design, we welcome you. We are so excited. Uh, this is, again, one of our favorite events because of just hearing the great innovations that are going on in the BMW area. Uh, UT assigned capstone is a required course. If you want to get your bachelor's degree in engineering or computer science, you, you must take UT design. Now, the cool thing about that is those students are ready to help and serve. Uh, if you're interested in potentially hiring UCS students, if you're interested in doing a project, maybe having some progress on a back burner idea, uh, we're here at UT Dallas, which is about 10 minutes uh, east of here. Last semester, if you look at your little brochure here, last semester, which just started with five weeks ago, God, five weeks ago, we have a record breaking number of students in our capstone program. 567 students started their engineering capstone project class uh, five weeks ago, 126 total teams. A record breaking sponsorship semester. We had over 85% of those student, uh, teams sponsored by projects by companies for 107 sponsored projects. So our next semester starts on January 14th. If you're interested in sponsored project, there's two people you need to know. One is Don Rochelle, Dr. He does thank you so but we're thrilled and excited to welcome our new computer science captain board relations director. It's Cynthia Hahn. So, Thank you, Rob. Okay, let's keep going. Our first set of speakers are the finalists in the Corporate Innovation Award. If y'all will make your way up here as I continue talking, I'll introduce each. Company by category and not that order, and each speaker will have five minutes to make a presentation. After this set of finalists is uh, done, we'll have some question and answer time for me. Um, the lunch is scheduled to adjourn by one. We hope to get out of there. But here by then, might not make it. Just full warning, you need to leave, we understand. Um, the Corporate Innovation Award recognizes a technology company for outstanding innovation and unique accomplishments through recent or potential breakthrough technology, a new approach with the technology or a new approach within the technology industry. The company must have a corporate headquarters or division office in Dallas, Fort Worth, and have 2020 operating revenues of more than $200 million. The speakers from Ericsson and Gearbox are going to join us virtually. Welcome in person. Um, to Briggs Home and Vex Robotics. So one person, <laughs> so I got the other one. Our first finalist in this category is Briggs Home. This home security company has created an internal enterprise data hub that holds data streams across the organization and couples that with a transformation office to track projects and improve efficiency. Tell us more, please welcome the Senior Vice President and CIO of Briggs Home, Jason Jensen. Um, so today we're going to be talking about what you just said, our, our, what we are calling our enterprise data hub. And hopefully we have some slides together that can really make it. Yeah, we have a clicker. <laughs> Does he have a clicker? Yeah, clicker. And I'm Jason Chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, I, 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 All right, I have to share the meeting. <laughs> this doesn't count for my five minutes. Um, so back about two years ago, we got bought by a private equity company. And we went on this mission. And really, our mission was to have this mantra that you sort of all heard. You can't, you can't manage what you, what you can't manage. And so we really had this goal of organization, and we were going to start making data-driven decisions. 
no more judges should decide our organization. So, when we knew it was going to be both a combination of technology and process, we knew that we were going to do And so, it really comes down to what I'm going to call these three areas. There's one more area, there's three more procedures. These are uh, first, we had to build this enterprise data. Um, second, we form what we call our transformation office, which is essentially a similar kind of PMO office, but we don't want to call it PMO office. Um, and it's really focused on how we make better investment decisions. Uh, so we had a PE company, so we had this influx of money, which we were making our investments properly. Um, and then we went on this journey to really start leveraging machine learning and leverage this enterprise data that we had built to um, test test items on a very multi-dimensional basis. So um, we just go to the next slide, please. Come on, back to the next so, <laughs> I will be that now, right? Um, so the enterprise data hub, my beautiful guy Aaron over here, really consists of probably five things. We've got this data lake, which I'm sure people are very familiar with. We consolidate all of our data. Um, we have this concept of governed data, where we take this data lake and we really uh, formulate it into definitions, organize it, cleanse it, make it so it's consumable by everyone. Um, we have uh, obviously visualization software that sits in the middle that really makes it everyone able to access the data, visualize it. We have what we call data walls. I call them propaganda walls, um, which we have established all over our headquarters that show relevant data about key KPIs that, that's happening across the company in real time. And then we've established a data portal, um, which people can go to and access all of this data. Even if you don't have access to visualization software, you can just go in this data portal and see it. So we now have this data of and we're now leveraging it to all kinds of interesting things around the company. I think two of the most interesting things we've done is again form this transformation office. Um, it was really all about again making really uh, investment great decisions. And it started with really this concept that we weren't going to start working on something until we um, really could measure uh, what the benefit was going to be from a true KPI perspective. No soft benefits here, having something you could measure. Um, any approval to spend on investment, how do you kind of come through this transformation office? And then the uncomfortable part is that we have this monthly accountability view where we look at where you said you were going to be in your journey to some initiative that you spend money on as an organization. And then the actual transformation office looks at the metrics coming out of the data levels and shows how you've done in terms of where you were supposed to be versus where you are. And then the other interesting thing we're doing with is really our, our machine learning program. Um, it's been an incredible success. And we're in the early days of our machine learning. Um, you know, we have this vast amount of data. We are data rich, um, brings home. And so we leverage that data to really make, you know, I mentioned multi dimensional decisions. And that's, I think, the most important thing that you're doing on machine learning is you're not just testing A versus B. You're testing A through Z all at the same time. You get the decisions extremely quick. We used it for our main use cases of customer retention, um, customer upgrades, lead nurturing. Um, and we are just, as we see, we are at looking for every opportunity out of this uh, machine learning here. So let's see. So what are the results then? Um, from a transformation office perspective, I'd say the first and most important thing is to know going into some uh, kind of eyes wide open, you know what the finish line is going to look like. Um, clear definition of success. We have brutal honesty. Uh, we have a PE based company, so it's really all about results. So we have brutal honesty in terms of how we're progressing, what our results have been. And then most importantly, um, we fail fast. If, if we get to a point and we're not, we're not seeing the results from the KPI perspective that we were expecting and we will pull out of our DEH, we pull the project and move on. Um, and I would tell you the result has been mostly positive investment outcomes. I would not tell you that everything has been perfect. Uh, but, you know, again, when we aren't perfect, we fail fast. And then on the machine learning side, um, it's been a phenomenal journey. Your company is not invested in machine learning. You should be. Um, our very first use case out of the gate um, produced in within four months, we produced over $2 million in NPE. And so we maintain control. So let's say that we were doing customer retention. We maintain control of our marketing department that set up for it, and how we're communicating with customers to try to make sure that they don't leave us. Um, and then we apply AI to a subset of those as well. I would tell you our AI use cases on average are producing about 200% improvement. So it's truly phenomenal through the transformation. Um, we believe that there's opportunities across the entire company, frankly. Anywhere we're making a decision, our focus is that we can start implementing AI to try to uh, make better decisions. And then really, like I said, we are we are making heavy investments now in AI. 
once we started to see what the value of this was going to be, it really was. I mean, we're getting payoffs within you know, two, three months on these investments. So it's just how fast can you go? How much money can you go to from? Um, and so, you know, as I said here, AI will transform how we make decisions as an organization. So, again, to wrap this up, you know, it's, it's our enterprise data hub is the foundation. It's this knowledge foundation of all these things that we're doing across the company, um, really based on this idea of trying to be able to measure um, everything in the company so that we can be a, a better manager. Thanks, Jason. The next finalist has developed a 5G distributed innovation network that is providing a collaborative environment utilizing a powerful hosted gateway and scalable architecture. I'm talking about Ericsson, and joining us virtually to tell us more about their 5G efforts is our vendor, Anand and Eric Leon. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Should I should I share the screen from here? That's the plan. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm Arvinder. Uh, so let me briefly introduce you myself. I'm Arvinder, heading architecture, technology, and end-to-end -end solutioning for digital services. You guys will be asking me, what is digital services? If you guys know, mobile network has two major parts in it. One is the radio, the network, and that's where my peer, Erin, will be talking about. And the other side is the digital part of it, where you have packet core communication services, all the orchestration and the monetization part. So we are here to share our journey with you guys. Okay. So welcome to our distributed innovation network. This is our company's 38 acre North American headquarter, very close to where you guys are in Plano campus. It's a great platform to demonstrate what our end users will face in deploying 5G in an enterprise and environment. Our distributed network, which is the campus, the full campus you see, it's fully 5G enabled. It brings the latest technology near real life and real time. What we do, we take these learnings from the theoretical perspective to practical application that allows our customers to take it and put it in there, uh, make it more realize this technology potential. This is a great platform to foster both partnership and innovation. And that's what we call it. It's about drinking your own champagne. And we bring this closer to our employees, to our customers, to our partners. So as you can see, the whole multi-campus is fully 5G enabled network. Now, let's go to what's there in the campus. If you can see, it's a multi-campus buildings, distributed architecture with data centers, at sites and a central office with a live traffic. You can, we have frequency bands in there for low band, CBRS and mid band. We have radio access networks deployed all over the buildings. And we have fully containerized solution, both 5G and non 5G standalone and non standalone to enable all those new use cases what we have been, you have been discussing in the market today. It's a very multi-vendor ecosystem where we work with different infrastructure players. And on top of that, we have the full OSS portfolio deployed for automation. You might have heard all those words, network slicing, service orchestration, that's already built in this campus. So it's like a real life network. And with that, we also bring all those automation technology enablers, which are continuous integration deployment to showcase some of those benefits that's going coming from the automation side. Without devices, no end-to-end. -end. So all the devices, even the UEs, like just one example is a robotic dogs. We got a full experience center. We bring all those exciting UEs to showcase and even realize those use cases within this campus. So here I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Erin. She's going to take us over some of those exciting use cases what we did recently. Over to you, Erin. Thank you, Avinder. Very honored to be here, to be virtually here today. Ericsson 5G Distributed Innovation Network is a powerful platform which enables us to push forward technology advancement with not just one, not just two, but many proof points. 
Now, let me take you through a series of breakthrough achievements through this platform. Starting from top left, we sent the traditional base station to the cloud. As you all know, telecom industry is going through a transformation to virtualize and automate its operation. And we took it one step further to combine it with AI video analytics on the edge to analyze parking lot utilization as an enterprise use case. Moving on to top right, we partner with Qualcomm to validate the 5G operation on the shared spectrum, CBRS, which stands for Citizens Broadband Radio Services. This spectrum is essential for innovation because it allows enterprises, school districts, universities to deploy its own private network using and sharing spectrum in a secured way. This first call pushes forward its commercial availability. Bottom left, we had so much fun pushing the envelope of the scheduling algorithm, which resides in the radio, as you can see in the picture. By forming multiple radiating beams, we broke several speed records on both the uplink and downlink with a state-of-the-art massive MIMO technology. Bottom right, also my favorite, we put a smart vending machine on a network slice over a software-defined white area network executing cashless transactions through the cloud. This collaboration has also won an industry award, MEF 3.0 Pop Showcase Award for Edge for Vertical. So as you can see, there is limitless possibilities for applications on top of a powerful 5G infrastructure. And we will continue to leverage this as an asset to bring in more and even greater 5G innovations to transform the industry and our society. Thank you. Thank you, Arden. That's from us. Is that the end of your presentation? Yeah, I think, yes. That's it, that's it from our side. Move on. Thank you, team. Thank you very much. Okay, our next finalist in the corporate innovation category is probably better known by franchise names such as Brothers in Arms, Battleborn, Fortnite, and his newest franchise, and one that earned this year's finalist nomination. Borderlands Science. Joining us virtually to give us more detail about Gearbox Entertainment and this new mini game, please welcome the Chief Communications Officer, Dan Hewitt. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak and present today. Uh, and that was a very kind introduction. Uh, so as was mentioned, some of you may be familiar with Gearbox Entertainment, which is based right up the road in Frisco, Texas. We have about 600 employees in Frisco, and we have offices in Quebec City, and we just announced a new studio in Montreal. Uh, yes, Brothers in Arms is one of our big franchises, as is Borderlands. Uh, and I'm here to, today to talk about Borderlands Science, which is a mini game within Borderlands 3. For those of you who aren't familiar with Borderlands 3, uh, it was one of the top selling games of 2020. It sold more than 5 million units within the first five days of its release. Uh, and we're incredibly proud that we could tap into the energy and passion of our community uh, for social good. So our mission is to entertain the world, but when we were developing Borderlands 3, we wanted to see how we could leverage uh, the popularity of the franchise for social good. So we began having conversations with a number of academics and scientists and researchers to see what could be done and how we could contribute. From those conversations, we partnered with researchers at McGill University, uh, as well as the Microseta Initiative to develop uh, Borderlands Science. And I believe you should be seeing my screen's presentation right now. So what is Borderlands Science? It's a free game within Borderlands 3 that harnesses 
the millions of people who are playing Borderlands 3 around the world. But let me take a step back. So only 43% of the cells in our body are of human origin. The rest belong to foreign microbes. Uh, these microbes, which in our guts, for example, uh, have a massive impact on our health and our well-being. Uh, each microbe, which is made up of DNA, has its own special DNA signature. Uh, and similar species of microbes have similar DNA. This is a problem because scientists want to map the human gut biome in these DNA signatures and these proteins, but computers often aren't able to do it because of the similarity and nuances of these uh, related DNA structures. When computers try to do it, they make a lot of downstream errors, uh, and there's a lot of problems when the computers go through to try to map this data. Uh, researchers told us that if we could figure out how to accurately pro map this protein, we'd be able to develop advancements in health and science and exercise and nutrition. Uh, and so that's what we wanted to tackle. But we needed to figure out how to make this into a game. So Borderlands Science is almost like Tetris. We have taken each protein and turned that into a cube or a, a block uh, that has a color and a figure on it. When players match those blocks of similar colors and style, what they're actually doing is mapping the human, pro mapping those proteins. And they're able to correct the problems that the computer created uh, in those sequences. When we wanted to, when we were rolling this out, we wanted to educate folks about this complex topic. And so we worked with Dr. Mayan Bialik, who many of you may know uh, from the Big Bang Theory, uh, or recently as one of the new hosts of Jeopardy. Uh, we are incredibly excited for her. Uh, and she was the narrator uh, for our trailer, our central piece, educational piece, that talked about the work being done, the contributions that gamers could make to public health uh, by playing Borderlands Science. As a reward, we provided players uh, in-game items that helped level up their characters and help them succeed in Borderlands 3. Uh, and let me go over a little bit of the impact. So as you can see here, we have had more than 2.3 million players solve at least one puzzle and more than 97, sorry, 91.7 million puzzles have been solved. The researchers at McGill University and the MicroSeta Initiative have told us that we have completed more than 60 years of research within months. Uh, we have been able to map the human gut biome to a greater degree than has ever been made possible before. Uh, and again, when we're looking at what the potential use is for this, uh, researchers at a uh, variety of universities uh, are telling us, because all of this data is open sourced, that the results can help improve research into uh, COVID, uh, as well as various SARS diseases, as well as potentially issues like dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, and that's something that we are absolutely looking to continue to contribute to. So we're very proud of the work that we've done, uh, as well as our partnership with academics and at McGill and the Microset Initiative, uh, and the accomplishments of the gamers around the world who have been playing Borderlands Science. If you're interested in learning more, feel free to check out dnapuzzles.org, uh, which highlights our, our Borderlands Science work. Thank you very much. In May of this year, the Robotics Education and Competition Foundation hosted 12,693 participants in what Guinness World Records classified as the largest online robotics champ robot championships. The RC partnered with our next finalist, Next Robotics, to create a new state-of-the-art online platform to, that made this worldwide competition possible. 
To tell us about this exciting platform and the competition it served is the CEO and Chairman of the Robotics and Competition Foundation, Dan Mans. Okay. Um, so again, my name is Dan Nance. Uh, why is the CEO of the REC Foundation here representing VEX? Uh, apologies from Bob and Tony, the owners, uh, co-founders of VEX. They have all company meetings today, but it was really felt it was important that they were here today. So I agreed to present on their behalf. So um, first, who is VEX Robotics? Uh, VEX Robotics is a division of Innovation First International, uh, a Dallas area uh, company that was founded in 1998. And I'll be honest, I'm surprised they've never been recognized before because uh, they've been around a long time and they've been a leader of educational, STEM educational products for two decades now. Uh, matter of fact, they're more than just uh, VEX Robotics. Hex bugs, if you have kids or grandkids, they're the inventors and the manufacturers of hex bugs. As also the, uh, the parent company of Rack Solutions, who transformed data centers back in Mark Cuban days. Um, when Mark was growing broadcast.com and we needed a way to, to rack these new Dell servers, it was innovation first that actually developed uh, and, and patented the rails that are used in data centers across the globe. But anyway, the RC Foundation runs VEX Robotics competitions in over 70 countries, and uh, there's over 2 million students that participate in VEX education programs. Uh, our challenge for this award, it started back in February of 2020 when the pandemic hit. And uh, we were running with best year ever. We had uh, um, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of students contributing. We run over 4,000 events that year. And in February, we just shut down. Fortunately for us, 97% of our season was over, um, but we had to cancel our world championship and we did a virtual event. Well, we knew things were going to impact the start of our season. So in July, um, Bob Miklich and I met in his office in Greenville, Texas, and we said we didn't want to have virtual competitions during the pandemic because we believe VEX Robotics, what the competition is, is developing the soft skills as much as the technical skills. That's the communication, the problem solving, overcoming adversity. And we feel the best way to do that was to still have hands-on experiences. But we knew there were going to be opportunities to travel. We knew much of the country wasn't going to be able to be in person. So we brainstormed in July of 2020, how can we still bring real robotics competitions to the students? And so that, that month, I actually announced to the world that we were going to still have competitions. In October of that year, we said we were going to do live remote tournaments. And in November of 2020, uh, that staff and my staff went to Dallas, Terrell, Waffle, and in Greenville, and we ran our first competition showing that we could connect different teams together, different students together to compete with real robots, not just virtually. Um, we do believe in remote, we, or excuse me, we do believe in virtual. We have over 2 million students in our virtual programs during the pandemic, but we do believe the hands on approach is just important. So what happens? So um, we uh, had our first event in November, and it was a train wreck. <laughs> we had uh, 16 teams from four countries and a bunch of different states, and we had a lot of things that we needed to learn. So Bob and the engineers at VEX really huddled together, um, and they developed a new streaming of all the video. We realized that trying to share the video across the globe and connect all these teams together was just too hard on bandwidth. So they streamed that. Um, we wanted to make this as accessible as possible, so we actually um, made sure that you could do it with a, a PC that was six years old, a, you know, a laptop and one simple camera that you could buy on Amazon or Walmart, and you could literally connect these teams together. So that was the impetus of what we call the live remote technology. So we're actually the slides. Here we go. So um, during the course of the year, we had ended up having three hundred three. Five LRT events uh, with 13,000 teams um, and, and then 1,400 teams from 30 countries competed in our LRT matches during our live remote VEX world. So, uh, basically, what we did, I love this slide. If you look to the right here, oops, the video is not going to work, so that's okay. But if you look to the right there, the thing about our LRT technology is schools could not compete in person. Um, so we had schools, clubs, parents build fields in their garages, in their basements, in libraries. Some schools did open up. 
Um, we had teams in New England that couldn't be indoors that actually set up tents in their backyard and put up fields. And with the low bandwidth technology that we developed and perfected, we brought all those teams together. So this video is actually going to show you one of the matches, but it's not well. I think you guys can get the idea. As we actually brought the world to clean. So these students were still building robots, programming robots, and actually competing. They weren't just doing something virtually. So there's a slide missing here. Um, anyway, uh, what happened is we culminated with the largest online robotics championship. So VEX uh, Robotics uh, has had world championships for 13 years, uh, but they've been in Anaheim and Orlando and, and Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Northbridge, California, but we announced that we were coming back to Dallas for 2021, and unfortunately, we had to cancel that event. But we still persevered. Um, we overcame our failures. We perfected the technology, and we had the great event uh, hosted here in Dallas. It was all remote um, to celebrate it and get us uh, recognized us with the world uh, world record for the largest uh, robotics championship remote championship. Uh, I love this quote here. Uh, you know, I won't read it to you, uh, but we literally we had so many, and I don't, I'm not exaggerating, we literally had thousands of thank you emails and letters from educators saying that this was the only thing that seemed normal to our students this year. We found a way to bring robotics to them. They were actually able to build robots, compete, something to look forward to, and you really made an impact. So we brought some normalcy to it. And that I'm very, very proud of. But to me, even though you know, in my opinion, this was a new approach in how to do robotics. It was an invention of necessity, but it's honestly fundamentally how we will change the robotics competitions going future, in the future. So the impact on this is more than just what we did through the pandemic. So we still believe in-person competitions are really, really important. What you learn with communications and teamwork, so you can never replicate completely remotely. But because of live remote technology, we're still bringing teams together and you're still competing with and against another team, you're still getting some of that. But what we really, really realize is the impact we're having globally. So what are some of the challenges on in-person STEM events, robotics in particular, or drones? The RIC Foundation loves drones programs too. Well, a lot of it, if you look at rural America, is travel, right? They're spread out everywhere. So in best case scenario, we'll have teams in North Dakota, South Dakota, rural America, they'll go to one event a year because that's all they can really do to travel. And so with LRT, these teams in these rural areas now can play every day of the week if they want to, but definitely every weekend. And then we have urban America, where for many, many issues that we understand, they're not able to necessarily go to events. There's so many obstacles. Again, now they can compete. Um, developing countries, you know, Internet, Innovation First International is in 100 countries. They have offices in China, in the Middle East, in the UK, in Luxembourg, in Australia. Um, but there's places in Africa and South America in particular that have robotics kits that have never been able to compete. So LRT has now bridged that gap and brought all these countries together that they're actually getting the experience of the And then there's other places like California and Indiana that have so many robotics teams that there's so much demand that they only get to compete once or twice. But in our program, we feel the more that you play, the more you innovate, the more that you um, have a chance to build your robots, the better experience you get. So now in places like that that actually have too many teams, they're using the LRT platform to compete more and have more experiences. And then finally, there's the fun part. In our program, some of the best teams in the world aren't in the US. They're in Singapore, they're in Australia, they're in New Zealand. And everybody's excited that one time a year where they come to Dallas or wherever we're competing and they get to meet these teams. But now with LRT, we're hosting events on Saturday. They're bringing all these countries together, and they're having it for fun. Like they get to compete with the people in Singapore, they get to compete with the people in China. Um, and it's really bringing it. So for me, I think robotics is a new language. Um, it really breaks down barriers. It really helps with cultural understanding. And it's hard to believe that a brainstorm in July of 2020 led to the development of this infrastructure product that's honestly transforming how we bring students into the STEM atmosphere breaking down barriers, and I really think will contribute to a better future. So, Bob and Tony, sorry you're not here. Um, a lot of pressure for me. I speak in front of 20, 30,000 people at a time, but I've never had to speak for Bob or Tony, but uh, hopefully I share what their vision was and what this small, what used to be a small North Dallas company is now transformed into a multinational conglomerate, what they've been able to contribute and how we're transforming education. So thank you for having me here today.
includes the presentations from our corporate innovators finalists. So we've got time for maybe one or two questions. For just a reminder for those of you who are joining online, please use the chat feature to ask your question. We'll have someone ask the question for you. Do we have any questions for our uh, finalists? Fantastic. So uh, one of the structures is because we're in 70 countries and uh, the different languages. So everybody speaks the language of robots, the programming and stuff like that. And one of the technical challenges is we actually control the start and stop of the maps with it. So we had to connect with countries in Africa or in Brazil or something to make, make sure we sync the start. But what we also did is we created a, uh, a chat room, right? And that's not innovative, right? We all can create chat rooms. But instead of using one, we created our own chat room where literally people could translate on the block. So um, we didn't want it just to be English centric, we wanted to be able to communicate. And so not only in spoken and written languages could you use the chat form, but we also supported it with American Sign Language too. So again, we're using robotics to bridge the gap. That's great. One more question. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the Corporate Innovation Award finalist is in the Thank The Emerging Company Innovation Award is presented by award sponsor Ericsson North America. As I'm talking with the uh, presenters, please come up. This award recognizes a technology company for outstanding innovation and unique accomplishments through a recent or potential breakthrough technology, a new approach with the technology or a new approach within the technology industry. The company must be headquartered in Dallas, Fort Worth, and have 2020 operating revenues of less than 200 million. The first company to present in this category is Casper. Representing Casper is in the room today is the Director of Sales, Shanna Santoni. And joining virtually to make a presentation about the process that safely disinfects the air we breathe in our offices is CEO Christoph Suchi. Oops. There you go. Hello, everybody. Hopefully, I will share the screen and you can hear me well. I will assume it's working very well. No problem. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, we're the Casper Group. And we're excited to talk to you about our continuous disinfection technology that's helping make the world a better place. As you've heard, Shana Santoni is in the room. I'm unfortunately not the CEO. I'm Dr. Christophe Sushi. I'm the co-founder, the inventor, and the chief technical officer at the Casper Group. We're a privately held company founded in Dallas in 2016. And if I tell you the company was born on October 31st, Halloween night, you'll probably understand the inspiration behind the name. Um, anyway, leaving uh, your house, obviously, lately is something that many of us took for granted. And while more and more are venturing out, many still feel unsafe in most settings. And the COVID-19 pandemic has created an unprecedented awareness, but nothing new has been done to try and mitigate the effects of a simple bad flu season or even reduce hospital acquired infection. Government agencies and other associations around the world are still asking us to use HEPA filters, UVC lights, and wait a minute, open the windows. I guess none of those have spent any time in Dallas in August. So we've been uh, using HEPA filters and those UVC lights for decades. Hospitals are even using ultra HEPA filters, yet those have not prevented COVID-19 infections inside those same hospitals, nor have they reduced the over 160,000 deaths per year due to those hospital acquired infections. And by the way, experts call those preventable death. If a filter would work the way it is, it's expected to, I could come into this room right now, light a cigarette, and no one would notice, correct? We know it's not the case, as the cigarette smoke will likely reach your nose and lungs before it reaches a filter. So why would a virus floating in the air be any different? 
Why should we keep doing the same things over and over again when we already know it's not enough? CASPER stands for Continuous Air and Surface Pathogen Reduction. And that's exactly what we do. CASPER is a mask for your environment. It not only disinfects the air around you, but also the surfaces. And it does so continuously, safely, and effectively. CASPER comes in several different solutions, but all use the same core technology. And it's a natural catalytic conversion process. This process uses a high intensity light source, irradiating a patent pending metal alloy matrix. That's complicated. But together, this too translates the ambient air into low level of oxidizing molecules that are completely safe for people, pets, and plants, yet incredibly effective at reducing pathogens. And CASPER has been proven to be up to 99.96% effective against MRSA, E. coli, Pseudomonas, VRE, Trichophyton, H1N1, of course, uh, SARS-CoV-2, to name just a few of those. And CASPER does all this without changing anything in the way you work, live, or play. So we looked at two of the most challenging environments out there, hospitals and schools, and I'm not sure which one is the worst, but if you want to find an indoor environment with plenty of germs and cross-contamination, I think those two definitely qualify. In a university, we've shown a 95% reduction of pathogens in the air and over 97% on surfaces in the bathroom. All those numbers are of course encouraging, but in the end, what matters to everyone at Casper is the impact we can have on our customers' health and ultimately, how many lives we can save. Some of our healthcare customers have conducted their own studies to show a tenfold reduction of pathogens all over the facility, leading to 42% reduction in staph absenteeism in the case of St. Luke's in Iowa, for example. More impactful are the results of a published peer review study conducted by Integris, not far from us in Oklahoma, showing a 54% reduction in hospital acquired infection after installing Casper in the HVAC system. Let me repeat that number, 54% reduction in hospital acquired infection. Some of those, by the way, leading to some preventable death. So at Casper, we're passionate about making the world indoors a better place, but above all, we care about the people we protect with our technology. Thank you all for your support. Thank you. Okay, next up, E4D Technologies is our next emerging company. The company specializes in the design and manufacture of high tech technical technology for the middle industry. Please welcome to see you in the car and tell us what's going To discuss the technology of finance, as I said, we've been in person since all the time, and we have cash for employees in our offices. We have not had one like transmission of COVID or even something out of the blue. So it's a pretty fantastic product. Next, we'll go to the next slide. Next, we'll go to the next slide. So, the first question I always get asked is who is for the technologies and how? And uh, we are trying to solve the problems of that in the family. Uh, we have patents, um, more than 30 patents that are both US based and international. And right now, our product is private labeled as three different companies. Which they get to around the world. Um, we also do, because we have a very talented team, we do do some of the training and manufacturing for other companies by me. So as you talk about the factory, you'll see other things besides more products. So we'll talk about that now. Um, 85 employees. And we just counted the other day, and out of those 85 employees, we think it's very representative of our DFWs. We actually have more than 12 countries representing those 85 people, which makes walking around our workplace at lunchtime very interesting. Um, we have, somebody said this and we liked it, so we put it in here. We have a super amazing company culture. 
But we laugh because we say it literally brings smiles to people's faces literally and figuratively. And I'll tell you how we do that literally here in a minute. But if you walked in our office, you would experience a lot of laughter because for all of us who've done product development, you know that if you don't laugh, you cry because not everything goes right the first time or the second time. Um, but this really diverse team and small team, the other people who are trying to play in our field are companies of hundreds, and yet routinely this little team of 85 people goes to shows and competes with those big companies, largely because of how well this diverse group of people, when they walk in the door, they bring their best self. And I think um, one of the things I said here is in diversity, we have people with PhDs and I'm not an engineer. And they start talking and writing math problems on the whiteboard, and I pretty much don't know what they're talking about. But we also have people that work from us that probably never graduated from high school. When they walk in the door, it's about doing the best thing for all the end customers. And they bring their best self, and they innovate every day in new ways, whether it's a better process or a better product. Uh, we do have a lot of engineers that work so my claim to fame is not that I'm an engineer, but I know how to hire really good engineers. And we have, with that team of 85 people, more than 500 years of experience across multiple engineering disciplines. So in order to explain what we do, it's really much easier just to show you, because you're all going to, like, maybe, maybe I'll show you. Can you advance me? No. It's not. No, we can't show you. Okay, well, imagine the picture of being at the dentist right now. <laughs> um, so I'm sure if I ask people online or here to raise their hands, many of you have had some sort of opportunity to go to the dentist and have some sort of restorative dentistry. You have a crown or an implant or it. On late, or maybe you had braces and they made you, um, I know this person that they made you put that horrible impression material in your mouth that you try not to gag, and they say it has to stay in there for two minutes, and the whole time you're trying to breathe through your nose and hope that you can survive that experience. Well, with our technology, you never have to do that again. <laughs> Um, it is completely possible to do that all digitally. And you know, someday there will be a picture up here that shows you this. But what we have is our engineers have come up with an intraoral camera that literally can scan your mouth in your whole mouth in less than a minute and a half if you're slow. And our software real time builds a 3D model of your mouth that you can watch live on the computer if your dentist puts it where you can see it. Um, and all of that does is it improves patient outcomes. I, I liked what Christoph said um, about the human piece of making it safe for people. We all want people to have the best outcome in the world, right? So if you go to your, it's like the last slide there. Oh, I'm too many. <laughs> come on, come on. There. So you saw the first picture, traditional impression material. I really we're gonna this side, I promise. Next one, please. <laughs> so, you knew we'd wait so long for pictures of people having nasty things stuck in their mouth. Um, but that product there in the middle is actually our camera, which, as it is scanning your mouth, it's projecting an image, camera's picking it up, and it's putting it in the software building model real time. The advantage of this is you can actually have a restoration same day in less than two hours from the dentist. Leave without having a temporary product, permanent restoration, better fit, then you can do the traditional way. So no temporaries. But the other thing about this is it creates a digital record that can be compared. So if you've been reading the research, dentistry is becoming more and more linked to your overall health. They want to have more diagnostic capabilities with dentistry. This software that can also link that image to other images from other um, x-ray or imaging equipment and begin to help provide your dentist and your doctor more information about your health. And because it's digital, that record stays and they can compare it year over year. 
So all of this being done, manufactured and shipped from right down the road in Richardson, Texas. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tim. Global Esports Technology Company East Posher has developed a STEM education platform to train and empower over 20,000 students in the technology of esports by 2025. To explain how East Posher is doing this, welcome CEO Danny Martin. Thank you for providing the opportunity to be able to speak about something I'm incredibly passionate about, and that's esports and gaming. Um, for me, growing up in subsector of Dallas, going to University of Texas San Antonio, I was an athlete, but most importantly, I was looking at how to engage with technology and gaming. And ultimately, from my perspective, it was how to build a technology platform that provides experiences for individuals to host gaming tournaments. Now, we know in the Dallas, uh, the Dallas area that you have large esports stadiums, but I always look at it as like, how do you develop someone to fulfill those roles of those stadiums? How do you build a tournament organizer to where they can host a tournament that can, you know, pack out a 20,000 stadium seating, you know, area? You know, from my perspective, it takes time. It takes some time to build that. You got to start from a smaller perspective. So for me, I'm focusing on building smaller locations. And for us, we're an ed tech technology platform that focuses on e-first experiences for individuals to develop their skill sets within the world of esports and gaming. We do that in two ways. We do that by way of the technology platform and that of our facilities. Currently, right now, we have a Duncanville location esports studio, which is around about 8,000 square feet. And we leverage that to allow students and parents and administrators to come in and see what esports and all the opportunities they're providing. When I first got into the space, I would look on to Indie or Monster and be like, how can I find individuals that can help me run my tournaments from the marketing side of it to the technology side of it to the competition side of it to the management side of it? And I just couldn't find it. Ultimately, there was a technology platform called HitMarket.net, which at that time, it was about 16,000 jobs available for individuals. And I was just like, only 16,000 jobs from a global perspective? That let me know how powerful it is for us to showcase these job opportunities that are in the spaces. And at this point, clubs, from an esports perspective, were not into high schools or colleges or such. It was just like, if you want to get into gaming and esports as an aspiring gamer, you're going straight to the pro leagues like that of your LeBron James going into the NBA. Well, that's not sustainable for everyone. Everybody is not going to be the LeBron James. So from our perspective, we looked at it as how can we help aid the aspiring gamers so that when they got better opportunities. And even though I'm here to say that we've had over eight gamers turn pro out of our organization that are competing for millions of dollars, we have better, 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 you know, value than how can we help build the actual graphic designers that are supporting those professional gamers, the photographers, the videographers, and the social media managers. When I think about our organization, we have over 30 employees right now, and over 75, 70% of those individuals are under the age of 25 which means that they can be recognized and ultimately employed by organizations with clients that are the NBA, the NFL, ESPN. These large corporations come to us to learn how to engage with the esports and gaming industry. So therefore, the students that are coming through our programs, they can actively showcase their portfolio to say, hey, I've done some work. I've done graphics for the NFL, which ultimately allows them to have better opportunities when it comes down to being successful within the industry. So let me break down some type of some statistics and I can go to the next. So if you look at the esports gaming industry right now, it's over a billion dollar industry. And over the next six to seven years, it's gonna reach around about $4.28 billion industry. That means that it's expansive growth. And when I think of growth, I look at how fast we've grown as an organization. As after COVID, we looked at it from the opportunity of creating this technology platform to students to learn all aspects of esports from a certificate perspective. And then we quickly recognized that the students are like, okay, what's next? Because I looked at it from a perspective of I got opportunities in the game and esports space simply for the fact that I will go to tournaments and showcase the value of how I can support those tournaments. When you're looking to get a job, that employer is saying, what have you done in the space? So for us, for the students are like, okay, I got my certificate, so how can I showcase it in a portfolio perspective? So what we end up doing is by way of looking at this stat, 
We created a platform to provide a full weekend program for our students. For the first week, the students are actively being able to log on the technology platform and learn management, marketing, technology, competition, production, and esports. And then we can measure their acuity. And then the second week, we're allowing the students to formulate groups of five. And we build functionality that allows them to actively do the roles of a general manager, a head coach, a marketing specialist, a production technician, and a software developer. These are roles that are applicable to any industry, but it's also applicable to the esports and gaming industry when you think about esports programs and clubs and teams around. We're fortunate enough to have teams like Complexity, which is owned by Jerry Jones and Jason Lake. We're fortunate to be able to have Team Infinity, which is one of the most popular esports organizations in the world in our backyard. So these teams and organizations run like traditional organizations. The roles that we are adding to our programs are very critical to the next pipeline for those organizations to be successful for years and years and years on. So from our perspective, those same students that are paired up into groups of five, we leverage our real athletes from a tradition, from an esports athlete perspective, give the students a, a fantasy element where we give them a salary cap and they're able to draft our real esports athletes that are actively looking to go pro in the actual scene of esports. On that third week, the students are, are utilizing our technology functionality, which we call a branded page, an e-collab page, and then also an actual e page in which the marketing specialist is able to showcase their marketing strategy by saying, hey, here's the actual teams that we drafted, here's the player bios, here's our logos, and they're able to apply that on our e-collab page, which is like a Facebook and Reddit. So it showcases them social media strategies in which they can say, hey, I've actively been able to post and show the traction of that. Everything is proprietary internalized within our platform. And so therefore, individuals like the production technician is to take clips from that of our actual uh, tournaments and leagues of the players that they drafted. And as many of you may not know, there are platforms like Twitch out there where individuals are watching games. And people will be like, why does someone want to watch games? Well, it's basically the same reason why you will watch LeBron James or anybody else play their sports actively. You look at it like, man, they're really good at it, and I may not be able to do that, or I can learn something from there so I can be just as good. So a production technician is essentially looking at that content and distributing it out to individuals so therefore they can be able to showcase it so individuals can watch it and be enjoyed and have an entertainment factor. This is the, very, the, base, the basis of a production technician. For our software developer on the actual platform for the students, the software developer utilizes a functionality called Brand Page, which is a micro website builder. And it allows the students to be able to build their own websites in real time. So the cool thing is that now that software developer gets to engage with marketing specialists, take content from them, get to take content from the production technician, get to take content from the, the coach, and then therefore by that fourth week, they're able to have a portfolio that they can present to their students, their admins, their parents, or even their next employers. So from our perspective, it's a great opportunity to leverage our technology platform to give portfolio experiences. So therefore the students can go to the same clients that we work with, like the NFL, NBA, e uses and say, hey, look what I've done. And this is the coolest element for individuals that, can, that are very geared towards STEM and organizations and education that are looking for new ways to engage with their students. And from my perspective, I know it's impactful because I was in the same boat as those same students. So from this perspective, we're looking to be able to impact individuals from a global perspective because these skill sets that are obtained from a younger perspective are applicable to any individuals that are in here from their company's perspective. And I can guarantee you, if you made a survey and asked your current employees if they're gamers, you'll be surprised and happy people say yes. Thank you very much. Our next finalist is Linear Labs, which is the first company to develop and own intellectual property on an electric motor. Yeah, so my owner sits down to talk. I've got a massive staff. Uh, 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 throw my select motor and pull me up. Um, old Army of the Country. So my name is Brad Hustle, the founder and CEO of Linear Labs. Um, go to the next slide, or do I need to do that? So the mission of Linear Labs is to end human suffering through amazing feats of engineering, primarily in Energy 2.0. That's different than Energy 1.0, which I call brain dead dinosaurs. Um, no real things to hold that in here. Uh, where Energy 2.0 is, is clean, it's renewable, it's more efficient, um, it's, 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 it's hopefully better for, for, for the world. 
Um, and starting initially with electric motors. Um, so 50% of the world's electricity passes through some type of electric motor. Um, think about that, that's incredible. One in two power plants in the world power some sort of electric motor. So if you can have an impact on the, the efficiency, the torque, I'll we'll talk about in a moment of an electric machine, you can fundamentally change the world. And human suffering is something I'm very passionate about. Um, later, different topic out of trash and latches. I'm very passionate about people suffering. Um, comes to being forms. Comes to being forms. And, and at its most basic level, human suffering is an energy issue. In fact, if you look back to the United, United Nations, the most um, accurate way to measure the prosperity of a country is based on energy. And they use a, a term called kilowatt per hour per GDP, which, which is very that's measure, measure for you know, how much suffering is happening in, in, in a country. Four million people die a year of some sort of pollution related disease. Think about that. Two million people die a, week, a year from the lack of clean water. These are both energy issues. Um, if you've been in the military, in many cases, war um, is a weather of suffering that's used in all sorts of ways, and it usually is, in, in many cases, as an energy issue. Um, so, go to the next slide. Uh, this company started uh, with myself and my father. I sold a company previously called New Street, which was a competitor to Twitch. So, uh, we uh, but, but um, software guy, my father did most of the nuclear designs and electrical, I mean, the, uh, most of the electrical designs for nuclear power as a kid or a business. Um, and it started off as a father son project. He said, Dad, you're a smart guy. I want to do something kind of cool. So, we can solve the real world problem, something that everybody says we can't do. This is going to change the world. It's a true, true story. And the, the idea I picked is I want to take old timey Texas windmills. Do you know what they're for? They're about water for cows, basically, right? And I wanted to see if I could get some sort of kind of electrical output from a windmill, not a wind turbine, and take them to Africa. Maybe we could, or South America, wherever we could change, change people's lives. You wash your hands, you know, clean water, you drink clean water, you can put a battery, you can generate electricity for LEDs. And, Store that electricity in the battery, you know, hot water heater. We could fundamentally, I felt like, reshape parts of the world. And through a weird set of events, my dad made a discovery. Um, and he discovered the first new true class of electric machine invented in probably 100 years. It went with Tesla, my father in the car, probably the guy missed this, Edison missed this. Electric motors had been the same thing for about 100 years. And so we, uh, we decided to build a company. Figure that. If you go to the next slide, uh, I'll show you some of it. Um, and, and I don't want to get too technical, but the defining characteristic of our machine, whichever motor is a generator and generators and motors, is that we produce twice the torque for the same volume, the same weight, the same amount of input, put of electricity. Um, and, and to tell you how big a deal this, um, this is a world where they were getting like 0.1% increases, 0.25% increases in, in torque and efficiency. Um, on the generation side, this is, this is sort of play, uh, you get a sense of how big a deal it is. If you were to put our architectures inside the Hoover Dam, and as soon as you get the metal to flow down, which there are ways to do that, we would double the output of the Hoover Dam overnight. It's a fire guy in Ranger in Texas, in a garage. That's funny how that would be used to work sometimes. Um, and so we're building a company, we're going to production as we speak. Um, we're based in Fort Worth. Uh, how many of us are there? Um, and just to close the big, I did a first of this kind $69.8 million tax incentive program for Fort Worth because I want to build motors in DFW. And, and here's why this is important motors today are mostly built in China and, and somewhere in Mexico. They're not really built in the United States anymore, now it's supposed to be. And the problem with that is motors are inevitable. When you think about it, I was just at this military conference. We don't, do we want motors in our military systems from China? No business China, I don't think, I don't think we do. I don't think most, most of the DOD does it either. That's a problem. But it's even bigger than that. It's a national strategic imperative that companies like mine get built in the United States. There are Chinese motors in our water systems. There are Chinese motors in our natural gas refineries. There are Chinese motors in our nuclear power plants. And guess what? Motors have Electronics and software also, which means you can manipulate. We don't know what we don't know. Um, so my team is um, working our butt off trying to get to production. Elon Musk has famously said it's uh, easy to build one, it's hard to build a thousand. <laughs> I'm learning that. 
the hard way. But what we're about to do, we're, we're ready to for us supply chain issues which are just right outside. We will be in production um, in, in Q4. We have to start in like Q1 and Q2 of next year, electric motors. And this is what it looks like. And, and this is the big discovery with that. And you know what? It's exactly cool. You found a way to combine a bunch of different types of motors in one. Um, the results is an incredible performance that has so much promise uh, for the world, the physics of the physics. Um, now I'm going to do the hard part next. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now it's time for Q&A for this group of finalists. Do we have any questions? Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask Tammy, do you have any dentists on your staff? The question in the room is, are there any dentists on the staff for him? We do not have dentists that work for E4D, but we have a lot of key opinion leaders. Actually, some of my team is in here right now because I have two in our office right now reviewing some Next generation products. So we have a lot of dent, and it's global because pro amazingly, dentistry is not the same around the world. So we also have dentists from other countries that provide input and use requirements, as well as just testing and giving us feedback on products. Okay. I have a question for exposure. Do you have any um, permanent linkage to the collegiate? Esports and are you providing paths for your students to go there? Great question. So um, many of you may not know, but I am the subject matter expert and adjunct professor for SMU for their first esports management program. Um, we started last early last year, uh, oh early this year in January. We just completed it two weeks ago, and we're about to start a whole another um, track for esports. So ultimately, that's a great way. For us to be able to showcase the value for our high school students that come through our program when we engage with like this week Dallas ISD that has students being bused to our facility and then also other schools as well. It's a great way for us to showcase the actual opportunities in a collegiate form when it comes down to uh, professing and you know engaging teaching the actual SMU students that are there. We're actively looking at doing that as well with other colleges across the globe as well. Yes, Bill. Brian, uh, do you have your motors uh, company data tested? Uh, and if so, where? The, the question in the room is are the motors out being beta tested? And if so, where? So, one of the challenges with this market is motors are in everything. So, the initial stage, I call the salad bar problem. We walk up to a salad bar, everything looks good, we should land with a few plates. So, to start, we kind of focus. As you might imagine. Um, so this is very real. We're, we're, we built these motors with a third-party validation. We're working with actually DTD, we are not on some of this stuff over the years. Um, we've sold, we're at you know, $70 million dollars in buying POs. It's the first market we're going to enter is what's called the electric, uh, live electric vehicle market. So think about it as a golf cart size mobility application of that sort. Um, it could be a drone, it could be a, a ground drone, it could be a lawnmower, down to mopeds and e-bikes, which is exploded. Kind of micro mobility is the first entry. A lot of reasons why we did that. Uh, those move companies move fast, people move the line, they know what to do. We will move into next. It'll be, I mean, there's, there's just based on the physics, as long as we don't completely screw it up, it should be in cars, it should be in air conditions, it should be in pumps. Um, the pump market is massive across the world. Agricultural water is the biggest suck of electricity, one of the biggest sucks of so air conditioning. So uh, we're starting with, with live electric vehicles, scaling that line, those lines up. I got a lot of early tests of people, people like that. Um, and, and, but we are, you know, we're, we're, we, we, we built out, we probably built, not that much, some, some thousand of these so far, but to get them to scale, not even, I want to build millions. So we're, we're entering this for a as we speak, many, a lot of machines and automation. I'm going to be able to pop a wheel in my golf cart. <laughs> You'll be able to, we put one in each wheel of your golf cart, your golf cart will have more torque in the wheel than the 2021 portion of the leather. And, 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 and a little thing about that. I need one of those. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the 2021 class of emerging company was presented by Erickson. Thank you all. The other finalists for the Tech Titans Awards will be announced at our annual awards gala, which we presented in a hybrid format, just like this. 
at the Eisman Center in Richardson the evening of January 19, 2022. And now let me please welcome uh, President and CEO of Tech Titans, Bill Sproul. She's been my board chair for the last uh, year and a half plus. She's done an amazing job. She helped launch our new Tech Titans Foundation with a personal donation and has a lot of zeros on it. And uh, she just brings all sorts of resources and credibility. How about giving Amy a big round of applause? So the game is really cool. Uh, it is really the eye of the performance of form of art. It's a purpose built to so many what we're doing. We're going to start with uh, learning sessions, two of them each at one at three o'clock and one at four o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday, the 19th of January. Then at five o'clock, we're going to have one of the best receptions that you're going to ever attend in person. I mean, we are going to be ready to party because we're back in person with each other. And then at six o'clock or so, we'll start the award ceremony. We'll be live streamed for those who can't attend, but we're we'll going to be able to accommodate probably 400, 500 people at the eyes of the center. So I hope that you are there to get your tickets and so forth. We've got some great programming still lined up for the rest of the year from our website, uh, techtitans.org, our forums, and our social interest forums are doing some great work. Our STEM team is out there, you know, in the schools, you know, inspiring next generation of technologists, et cetera. And so um, I just hope that you stay engaged with us. By the way, just show of hands, how many of you, this is your first time to be an in-person event since the lockdown started? Come on, I know. Look at that. Yeah, we got you out, didn't we? Good for you. All right, we'll keep coming out. Um, go buy your Casper or whatever you know, <laughs> Christopher Casper or whatever. And uh, stay safe and have a great rest of the day. Uh, yeah, by the way, so are there any Oklahoma fans in the audience? <laughs> are there any uh, Longhorn fans in the audience? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> woohoo, woohoo. The center. Okay. <laughs> First of the Baylor Bears, and, uh, so I hope they go out and bring me a beautiful weather outside. It's October, and we are uh, thanks. Thank <laughs> you.